Ich sage auch nochmal einen schönen guten Morgen, herzlich willkommen auf der SMX 2017. Ähm, ich dachte mir, Gott, mit dem Trailer, das hat mich jetzt echt nervös gemacht. Ich glaube, das nächste Mal kommt ihr irgendwie mit Rauch noch oder sowas. Ne? Wo ist Elliot? Ne? Elliot, irgendwas mit Rauch oder sowas. Ähm, Ganz verrückte Sache, aber ich glaube, das hat uns Spaß gemacht, zumindest mal großartiges Video. Und ich glaube, bevor ich gleich Rand noch mal vorstelle, ich wollte vielleicht noch ein bisschen was sagen zu diesem Thema 70 Sessions und 80 Referenten, weil ich glaube immer, was wir uns im Fachbeirat, was die Gedanken sind, dass wir eigentlich uns um drei Welten bewegen, nämlich einerseits Dinge, die heute für uns wichtig sind. Das sind die Themen, die wir versuchen immer zu positionieren. Ich glaube, Dinge, die irgendwie so am Horizont sind, wo wir so das Gefühl haben, äh, das kommt relativ schnell, dass wir äh, dem auch dementsprechend Rechnung tragen. Und äh, ich glaube, der dritte große Aspekt äh, seit letztem Jahr, beziehungsweise vorletzten Jahr, haben wir so einen Future Track, äh, dass wir auch immer Dinge positionieren, äh, wie dieses Jahr zum Beispiel über Mixed Reality äh, und äh, Visual Search, Dinge, die vielleicht heute noch keine große Rolle spielen, aber vielleicht dann doch über morgen tatsächlich eine Präsenz haben. Und deswegen, ähm, ich freue mich selber wahnsinnig. Ähm, ich kann mich immer wahnsinnig schwer entscheiden, was ich moderiere. Ähm, ich darf immer so ein bisschen wählen und dann überlege ich, ah, mache ich SEO, mache ich AdWords oder mache ich Data oder den Future Track. Und ähm, wenn es für Sie schwierig wird zu entscheiden, dann haben wir immer einen guten Job gemacht. Wenn Sie sagen, soll ich auf die Session gehen oder auf die Session, äh, dann freuen wir uns immer, weil dann glauben wir, dass wir einen guten Job gemacht haben. Ähm, in diesem Sinne, I switch to English now and I say just a very quick welcome. Uh, we are very happy to have you all over here. And um, I think, uh, I wouldn't say we're running out of time, but we should uh, soon start. And uh, so, quite like every year we have rent over here. It's a big, big, big tradition. And so I don't think that we need any introduction for rent because rent is just a so well-known SEO online marketer. He's um, the founder of Moss and the former CEO of Moss. And um, but I think for us, most important is that on every keynote he gave in the last years, um, we all just uh, walked out and were always so inspired. And uh, so I'm so happy to have Rand over here and uh, welcome Rand for our keynote in the morning. Welcome. Thanks. 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 Wow, I don't know. Can I follow up that video? It's going to be going to be a real challenge. Guten Morgen. Morgen. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for having me again. It is wonderful to be back in Munich. Uh, and while I'd love to uh, have an extended hello this morning, unfortunately, we have an incredible amount of content to get through, a ton of stats and data. I know most of the time that when I, when I stand up here, I, I have some um, very specific topic that I want to talk about, and it is uh, hyper-tactical, right? I want to give you like a bunch of actionable advice. I do have some of that in this presentation, but one of the things I wanted to do uh, in 2017 is take a little step back, right? And let us look at the market in which we exist, the market that governs our professions. And You can, you can find all of these stats and data up here. You're certainly welcome to take photos if you like, but uh, all, the, all the stats and data is in there. And so what we've been able to do um, on this front is to partner with uh, the folks at JumpShot. So I wanna, I'm going to talk about them for just a second, not because they paid me. They, in fact, did all this research for free. Uh, but basically, JumpShot has this panel uh, in the United States of several million Uh, users, and they have software that essentially tracks on both mobile devices and desktop devices uh, all of the activity that happens in the browser. So this is clickstream level data, and clickstream data allows us to do things that we could not otherwise access. It means that, you know, uh, browser activity that happens in incognito, we get to see. Browser activity that happens in an email, we get to see. Uh, every search result that's opened, we get to see. Every click from a search result that's opened, we get to see. So that, that kind of data lets us do some really cool things, some data that, very frankly, Google has not been particularly public about. Amazon has not been very public about. Yahoo and Bing have not been very public about. I do have one apology, which is, I don't have data for Germany. However, 
however, or, or the EU. However, I think that much of the percentage type model data you can apply in most Western countries, right? They're going to they're gonna act pretty similar, and we've seen that statistically uh, to the United States. So, one of the things, you remember last year, Google told Search Engine Land, right? Danny Sullivan asked, and, and they, came, they came out. This was May of last year. They said, uh, more than 2 trillion searches, we process more than 2 trillion searches a year now. And, and we all kind of went, okay, so let's see. That means a minimum of X, but, but we don't really know how many that is. And with clickstream data, we can know a lot better. So we did this cool um, T model scaling thing and basically came up with, uh, based on the panel size uh, and the number of queries performed per searcher, this is what we know today, right? 40 to 60 billion searches happen on Google.com in the US each month, uh, which is you know, about a quarter to not quite a half uh, of Google's two trillion number. But remember, Google was giving a number for the whole world. That's just the US. So I think that two trillion number is actually quite low. We should be able to, with a couple other countries uh, over time, figure out what the true number is worldwide and then be able to size that to different countries. I think that'll be very, very cool. We'll also be able to, over time, see whether search activity is growing or shrinking. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's growing. We're all pretty sure it's growing, but regardless. Okay. Uh, in an average session, an average session on Google is actually a lot longer than I thought. I thought most searches take like four seconds, five seconds. Turns out an average session, this is like the time that someone spends in their browser visiting the search results and then potentially visiting other websites before they come back to Google, if they come back to Google, that whole average is a little under a minute. Uh, the percent on Google's own properties, 12%. 12% of the clicks that happen in Google go to other Google properties. That's actually a little more, a little lower than I thought. Like, I was scared this number was gonna be 40%. That was, that was freaking me out. Uh, the, the percent of people who change their query after searching without performing any other clicks, that's much higher. Like a fifth of people are doing this. No wonder, no wonder, do you see in Google now there's related searches and people also ask on almost every SERP, right? You see those so often and that is because clearly Google knows lots of people are changing their queries. Or it's a chicken and egg problem and in fact Google putting that there has meant a lot of people change their queries. Not, not totally sure. Uh, pogo sticking activity. Pogo sticking is right where you uh, search, you click on a result, and then you are unhappy with that result, so you click the back button and choose something else. Uh, that happens about 8% of the time. So if one of, this is a cool one because if we watch this over time and Google is actually getting better at serving searcher demand, that number should drop, right? It should get lower. Okay. Uh, this is what the search demand curve looks like, roughly speaking. Uh, I get that this is a uh, challenging visual to comprehend, but basically you can get the sense that the, uh, the top one billion keywords, right, the, keyword, the one billion keywords with the most demand account for only 36% of all searches. Like the long tail is huge. It is massive, right? You don't get to you know, around 100% until you get to 100 billion different keywords. So for those of you who are, who are concentrating your keyword efforts on the head of the demand curve right up here, there's probably a lot of people searching back here. Uh, average searcher is doing about 3.4 queries. That's um, per day on desktop and mobile uh, each, right? Because this is by device. That, uh, what we have so is some data on the click-through rates of mobile versus desktop. And I think you'll be fascinated by this. So this is, here's a mobile, mobile search for SMX Munich. 2% on average, uh, uh, this is across all searches, on mobile, paid gets 2% of the clicks. 2% clicks. 40% go to organic, so 40% of searches result in an organic click about 20 times, right? And then 57% don't click at all. No click whatsoever. That is crazy, but it shouldn't be surprising, 
right? Think about what happens when you search for weather or what happens when you search for directions or what happens when you search for a flight time or a sports score or a, a million different things where Google is answering the query right away immediately. Or you ask how, you know, uh, which movies was Robert Downey Jr. in, right? And they, they just tell you. You don't have to click anything. It's right there. Your bar trivia solved. Desktop. Desktop uh, paid gets a little more, 2.8% of all searches result in a paid click, and 62% in an organic search. 35% don't click. So considerably lower, right? About, about half, uh, sorry, um, about a, a third lower on no click and, on, uh, and a third higher on paid and organic in the desktop results versus the mobile results. By the way, you're, you're the first people in the world who get to see this outside of like me and four people at, at Jumpshot and Moz. Uh, this comparison makes me think a couple things. First off, you know how Google says there's now more searches on mobile than there are on desktop? Yes, I agree. But is there more traffic? I, I'm not sure. Right? Because think about how much more search demand there would have to be on mobile to account for the lower click-through rate so that you would actually have more desktop traffic. So if you're looking at your statistics and you're saying, gosh, we must be doing something wrong in mobile or our optimization isn't there, well, maybe that's the case and maybe it's just that the demand, the click demand, uh, is not there yet. I think it will be over time, right? Eventually mobile is going to overtake desktop to such a degree that this won't be a question. But for right now, might be there. All right, big change. Uh, in years past, I think we've known that, that it was pretty much all Google. Now some of us have some suspicions that other properties, other web properties are creeping in. And I'm not talking about just, you know, like other search engines being in Yahoo. I'll show those in here too. But uh, that is basically the breakdown. I want to call out one detail. This was done in October of 2016. And I, when I saw this graph, right, when I saw the data and, and we had to double and triple check it because I just could not believe that Google Images was getting almost half the search volume as Google.com itself. That was like, that made no sense to me. I had never thought that Google Images was that big. How could that possibly be the case? So we had, we had one theory about why this data was this way. Have you ever been to the United States in October? You know how people have to dress up in weird costumes? I think that might be Halloween. Like everybody in the whole, every parent is doing like 50 million image searches, right, for their kids' costumes. Every kid is doing searches. Every hipster is doing searches. I, of course, fall into one of those categories and in doing tons of searches, right, to try and figure out my costume. So maybe, maybe like some of this is Halloween, but... Regardless, that's crazy. Like, that's an insane amount. I can't imagine Halloween is half that, which means Google Images is massive. So uh, what I try to do is take a number in the middle of this. Let's assume there's 50 billion searches that happen on Google.com, right? The, the median point between 40 and 60. Uh, that would mean that Google Images has 22 billion. It would mean that YouTube has got 3.1 billion. It would mean that Yahoo has two. Bing has a little under two. Google Maps, 1.76. Uh, note, we can't measure uh, apps. We can only measure browser activity. So Maps and YouTube searches that happen in the app, not in the browser, are not going to get counted here. Uh, Amazon, Amazon creeping up, right? Like Amazon doing half the searches that YouTube is? That's, that's a lot. And that does not count voice, right? So the little Alexa device that gets triggered, that's, uh, that's not. Facebook is much smaller in terms of search, but still sizable, right, 580 million. Uh, and DuckDuckGo, the, the sort of privacy-centric search engine that's been taking off the last couple of years, thanks to Snowden and the NSA, uh, 470 million. And then Google News in, in sort of sad last place here at 236, which makes sense. I think people go to Google News as a destination to see what the news is more so than they go to search it specifically. All right. One of the big changes that's happening in our industry 
uh, and, and certainly I'm sure many of you have perceived this, is that years ago, if you started a website, SEO could be your first step into marketing, right? It could be the first thing that you would do, and that, that could work great, right? Uh, you could basically do SEO without many other or nearly any other forms of web marketing. Well, now that's changed a little bit, right? I'd say today, SEO is, sort of, is all, partially at least a result of doing other kinds of great marketing. It is very, very difficult to do SEO on its own, solo, without the rest of these. And why is that? Well, I think it's like a change in the ranking inputs, right? So years ago, and I'm talking more like five to seven years ago when, when this was really the case, right? Things like on-page use and links and anchor text and keywords and domain name and internal linking and page rank flow and all that kind of stuff, that was how you did SEO successfully. It was... Uh, just as technical as it is today, but it lived almost on its own apart from all these other things that are now important, right? The overall uh, relevance and value of the content, which years ago you didn't need nearly as much. Uh, you know, branding and memorability, that, that is something that's relatively new. Uh, searcher satisfaction, <laughs> you know, back in the day. Good way to do SEO, stay under Google's radar. Today, good way to do SEO, have nothing to hide. It's a little, um, a little bit different. So if you're launching a new venture, I think the way I would go about this is to think about brand and product first, then your unique value proposition, how you're going to provide that value, then the audience and influencers who are going to help you spread that, the content and the user experience that provides and then, then I would do SEO, right? But years ago, you could sort of go, ah, hey, you know what, I'll put this right up here. I've got a brand and a product, great. I'm gonna do SEO, that's how I'll get it out in the public. Uh, I think it is, oh gosh, who's talking, in a, uh, I think right after this session about SERP features. Yeah, Astrid's speaking about, uh, features, SERP features. And so I, I'm going to go into a little bit of click-through rate, and then you should go check out uh, her session and see more. But these SERP features are nearly universal. We have only about 3% of results total that have no SERP features at all. You know, 10 blue links, like classic 10 blue links, 3%, that's that small. Uh, and these do massively impact click-through rates, right? So. If I do a search for what to do in San Diego and I see, you know, here's the AdWords ad, here's this, this top sites sort of card style results, here's knowledge graph, uh, we're estimating that that's only the organic results, right? Poor TripAdvisor down here, ranking number one. Uh, the organic results are only getting a 38% click-through rate on a search result like this. The rest is going to other places. Um, and a lot of features, a lot of different kinds of features take away organic SEO opportunity, right? So uh, things like, yeah, the, the best comedies on Netflix, right? These card boxes, the maps results, uh, the, the instant answers and featured snippets. Some of them are truly taking away click-through rate. But some of them are actually giving you more opportunity if you know where to optimize, right? If you're doing SEO in the right spots. Uh, and so, you know, I can show up there. That featured snippet is mine for the taking. And this is actually great because these are not all the steps to making pasta uh, with semolina. Like, I, I, I have to click. This is my, one of my favorite ways, by the way, to do featured snippet optimization is draw them in, but don't give them everything they need, right? Make them have to go and click you. Uh, you can show up here, too. So in those people also ask boxes, the featured snippets that appear in there, those are yours for the taking. They're not classic organic SEO, but they follow a lot of the same principles. It's like doing featured snippets for these individual uh, questions, lots of opportunity. You, you can show up here, right? John le Carre, the, the, the spy author from the you know, 60s and 70s. Uh, you can claim those and own those. Uh, you can show up here right, in these video results. You can show up here in the featured snippet. You can show up down here in the people also search for, right? That, that is optimizable as well. And here, you, and here in the app store. Uh, th 
this is a different kind of SEO, but it's still ours. Like, we're still the ones who do that work. There's nobody else. There's not like a new band of featured snippet and, you know, SERP feature marketers who are like creeping into our territory. No, this is us. People who want those clicks, they come to us. Uh, I'm not going to go through every one of these, but I did make a chart that you can check out in the presentation with a bunch of links for best practices so that if you are seeing yourself in a bunch of these, here is uh, a lot of good advice from folks all over the web about the best way to get into those and optimize for them. Uh, there's those eight, and there's these eight as well. So there's, there's like 16 feature types that I think every SEO should be considering as an optimization target. Uh, and that, that is how you can get in those. Some data from the Clickstream side of things. Uh, so actually, two sides. So jump shot on the Clickstream data side, and then Mozcast, which Dr. Pete runs. right? And Dr. Pete has got uh, you know, this, this multi tens of thousands uh, of SERPs set that he monitors and looks at the uh, percent of SERP feature appearance in those. So these AdWords ads are showing up in about 55% of all results, which is aggressive, but not surprising. And they get about 3.4% of clicks, 15% uh, of results for maps with just about a percent of clicks. Those tweet blocks, they don't show up a whole lot, but they, they also don't get a great click-through rate. Um, what I don't know is I don't know how many people click this and are sort of browsing those just to see what people are sharing. But that, uh, that partnership surprises me a little more given how low that, that click-through rate is. Uh, although, uh, Google Shopping pretty much you know, is not doing amazing either. Uh, so it shows up in 9% of results, gets about 0.55% of clicks. Uh, image blocks. 11% of results and 3% of clicks. YouTube, YouTube's got a high click-through rate. Like when it does appear, which is not that often, less than the Twitter blocks. We see more tweet blocks than we do YouTube uh, results or, or video results that include YouTube. Uh, but when they do, they're getting a higher click-through rate than a lot of their peers in this, in this data set, which I think isn't that surprising. A lot of times people are looking for that specific video. And then those personalized Gmail results, I have no idea because we can't view personalized results with Mozcast. I don't know how often they show up, but clickstream data, you know, JumpShot actually knows that they get a, lo a fairly low click-through rate. By the way, I don't, I don't know why my Gmail can't find any of my flights. Someone, I, clearly I fly places, right? Like obviously I did not swim here. That would be really hard. Uh, top stories, we don't have data on that one yet because October is when they, uh, Google changed from news to top stories. So I don't have that one, unfortunately. Uh, but we do have the knowledge panel, right, or knowledge graph results. And that's, that's quite popular, but not a very high click-through rate. I think that a lot of that is about showing people an instant answer, like giving them the, the, the data that they want. However, I don't know if you noticed, but when I, when I pulled up this search for Jeff Goldblum, something struck me as really weird. Like, really, really weird. Do you see that bottom result there? This one. Amazon.com, Jeff Goldblum custom waterproof shower curtain? How in the world is that ranking? That seems impossible. Does that seem, like, that seems crazy. Super crazy, there's no possible way. The only way that could be ranking is if a lot of frickin' people are really interested in getting a Jeff Goldblum shower, waterproof shower curtain. Aren't all shower curtains waterproof? What would be the point of a non-waterproof shower curtain? All right, this is insane. You know what? We gotta see what's going on. Like, we, let's click it. Should we click it? Let's see what, holy shit. Oh my God, Jeff, what, what is going on? The only thing that might be better is this other thing that people also buy as a shower curtain. Like that's, I'm telling you, there is some magic going on in this world and is being reflected in Google's results. Uh, that's nuts. If you didn't think click-through rate was a factor before, now you know that it is. Uh, okay, uh, another big change, mobile apps. So mobile apps, I think a few years ago, a lot of us were scared that potentially the app world was going to eat the mobile search and mobile, uh, uh, 
browser world, and we would have to be doing tons of SEO for apps. And it is true, people spend an incredible amount of time on their mobile devices, in apps, uh, 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 right? Here's, here's the, the time spent in apps, 90%. 90% of the time spent on mobile is in apps. Oh my god. But look at the breakdown. It's a lot of Facebook, YouTube, gaming, email. Man, I don't... It doesn't super scare me. Oh, and by the way, browsers are counted as apps in some of these numbers, which that freaks me out, because then I go, wait a minute, I thought the browser was being compared against the app. Well. OK, check this out. Apps is essentially a winner-take-all market. Most people on their mobile devices use an average of three apps, just three. And it's almost always Facebook and Maps and then something else. A lot of times that's YouTube. Some of the time it's email. Some, for some people, it's Twitter. For some people, it's WhatsApp. For some people, it's Snapchat or Instagram. But it's usually an average of three. I recognize all of us in this room are like, what? I use 10 apps. I use them all the time. Yeah, we're weird. We're very different from normal people. Like, I'm, I'm telling you. All right. So uh, the lesson here is what? That my app has to be a top 10 app? Kind of, right? If you want, if you want to be taking that app time, you better be in the top 10. Otherwise, it, there's not great points here, right? There's not, there's not tons of opportunity. Like, you know, beyond that, look, look at the drop-off in terms of time spent. It's just, it's kind of pathetic beyond those first few. And so I think, I think what this is saying to us is that apps are very, very valuable for a few very powerful companies who've done an incredible job, uh, you know, of dominating screen time and dominating our interest. And then for the rest of us, it is all about the website, still about the website, right? And unless we think we're truly going to break into that top 10 or we have this extremely good use case, powerful use case for our specific audience for an app, I think the days of, oh my God, everybody's going to have to build an app are, are over. Like we don't, I don't think that, that world never came to be. It did not get proven out, thank God. I was really scared. There is also a much better alternative called... Um, Progressive web apps. If you have not checked out the world of progressive web apps uh, and haven't considered those, that they're doing some remarkable things. I, I think uh, last week Forbes actually switched to a progressive web app. A number of large media sites have gone that way. And it lets you do almost everything, like not quite everything that, a, that an app, a native app can do, but very close. And that power is, is pretty exciting. One other thing, I would just be a little cautious you know, years ago, we were sort of like, oh my God, mobile is coming. Everyone, we need to get on mobile. You're, if your site isn't mobile friendly, you're going to be doomed. And now I, I just have a slight bit of nervousness that everyone's going mobile first and maybe even mobile only. And I'd be cautious about that because desktop hasn't died. It just plateaued, right? I mean, desktop is not much less popular than it was six years ago. It's not. It's just, it just hasn't grown like a, you know, uh, like a hockey stick to curve the way mobile has. And that's okay. Just be cautious that you're not ignoring your desktop uh, traffic. I think that, that could, be, could be dangerous, and I'm seeing some signs that that's happening in the web marketing world. All right. Whew. So, in years past, we told Google, I want this thing, and I want it right now. And then Google delivered that thing to us. And the only thing it used was the words and phrases that we typed in, right? Well, now that's changed, right? Today, Google sort of knows what you want, uh, sometimes better than you do, which is a little freaky. Um, and it, that can come from all sorts of places, right? So th these are the elements that, that uh, generally speaking, the tech sector thinks are a part of that. Location and prior behavior of users in that location. So for example, if all of us do lots of searches around you know, the time when the uh, U2, U2 uh, train right, comes by here, then 
as someone starts typing ooh into their browser or into their search, Google will predict if they're here that that's probably what they want. And I think that's probably the case already. Device attributes, right, the type of device, the OS, uh, the speed, the installed apps. They're using uh, your browser history as well as your search history and your app history. They get to use Gmail behavior and uh, possibly, in, in many cases, all of the keyboard behavior. Uh, around Gmail, right? So they know lots of things that you type in and therefore can predict what your searches are. And then lots of time-based elements, right? So like at this time of day, you pull up Google Maps, they think you probably are looking for coffee, right? In a few hours, it's going to be lunch. A few hours after that, it might be transportation. And then a few hours later, it's going to be dinner. And then late night, it'll be drinks and bars. Uh, different people get... And, and different devices get different types of results, even in exactly the same place at exactly the same time. So here's me and a friend who was in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, he was visiting Seattle, but typing in the same thing at the same time. As you can see, Beastie Boys, very popular, as is Beast Mode, which, okay, there's hard to explain. There's an American football team in Seattle called the Seahawks. They had a player a couple of years ago who was very good at running people over, and they called it beast mode, and all right, yes, you know, sports things, challenging to explain. Uh, these kinds of dis different results make a lot of the SEO work that we do hard, harder anyway, because we can't measure it quite as well, right? And it, it, it's not just suggestions, like this is, it, it's rankings too. So if I search for uh, Storm, right, and I am in Seattle, I get the women's basketball team, the WNBA team, the Seattle Storm, uh, and in San Diego, of course, I get the comic book character, because San Diego, people mostly surf and read comics. It's, it's a wonderful town. You should definitely go. Productivity is low, but quality of life, very high. It's, it's sort of like Italy, right? That's, that's, all right. Italy, the San Diego of Europe. You should definitely go. Italy has better food, though. Uh, so... If, if Google becomes this like suggestion type of engine, right, where instead of, instead of us telling it things that we want, Google tells us things that we probably want, right, or that it's pretty sure that we want, and the more it learns, the better it knows. I, I think what gets dangerous here is like the only places that marketers can influence decisions are at the very beginning, right, when people are unaware of what Google will suggest to them or what they're about to search for, or you have to be able to win at the very end when they're making the decision. And I think that is pretty hard. That is a challenging thing for a marketer to do. Unaided, to be able to, to win in a comparison scenario, eh, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't love it. Right, so for example, I'm going to Japan in a few weeks um, on an actual vacation, which is insane. I haven't been on a vacation in, oh my God, nine and a half years. Um, like a vacation, you know, where you don't work. <laughs> have, you, have you ever been on one of those? Me neither. It's, it'll be exciting. I'll tell you how it goes. We'll see. Uh, so I'm going to Japan, and I found this article. Like uh, someone referred it to me, or it was suggested to me by Pocket or something. right? And so it's talking about all these amazing resorts that I could go to, these ryokans in, in Japan. And so I, didn't, I had no idea where I was going to go yet. But by the time I reach that evaluation stage, right, where I actually say, okay, I think I want to stay in a ryokan, and I'm pretty sure I want to go to this resort town outside of Tokyo called uh, Karuizawa. And by the time I got there, like, there was only one result choice for me, the one that I had already read about. Unfortunately, it's actually this one, which I couldn't read, because I, don't, I can't read kanji. But regardless, I, I did find my way there, right? And so I, this goes to this... You know, they can't, be, they can't win my attention here because I've already made up my mind back here, right? Once I've been biased by something, it's tough. That is a, I think that's a real challenge for marketers in this suggestion-based world. Another challenge, and we know this, right, from, from Google taking all these clicks, right? The 57% the, uh, that they take on mobile, the 35% that they take on desktop where there's no click at all, right? It, a query like this, 70%, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, 75% of people don't click, right? Only about 25% will actually perform a click here. Uh, so 
blended average, like merged blended average, that it's almost, almost half of searches result in no clicks. That's, that's crazy. What is Google doing? Like, why are they so aggressive with this? Especially, especially when it costs them money. It costs them real money, right? Here's a search for, you know, Japan Ryokan prices. And, like, there's two ads up here. These people are paying serious dollars to earn that click. And yet, Google is willing to do this, right? And this. That's, that blows my mind. They're taking away their own dollar opportunity to answer a query in advance. Why are they doing this? I think they're doing it because they know that those answers lead to happier searchers, and happier searchers means more searches over time. And I think if there's something we've learned from Google over the last decade, it's that they're willing to sacrifice short-term profits and revenue for long-term wins, at least most of the time, until they have a few bad quarters in a row and then the ads get really, really subtle. Like, oh my God, look how subtle that ad is. You can barely tell that's an ad. Ridiculous. Uh, and yet still the click-through rate, not you know, all the way there. So this is, this is my, my theory, right? That they're willing to sacrifice that short-term revenue. And as a result, my guess, and we're seeing this a tiny bit, but my guess is that they're gonna do more and more specialized advertising programs where the ad is the answer. Because they can't afford to, to sacrifice all this money, right? And give up this incredible market, uh, uh, market capitalization that they've got. They need to make some money too. And so I think we're gonna see more stuff like this, right? These specialized ads that appear in apps, the, the, the flight searches, the app, uh, 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 the real estate stuff, right? Take a lift to SeaTac, here's an ad for it. I, I suspect that might be the case. And that's gonna be tough for organic marketers to compete against, which, which is gonna mean more of a blending. Like we're gonna have to keep going on this blending of SEO and paid. Uh, in organic, on the organic side, I think the, the, the best opportunity we have here is the featured snippet. Like, featured snippets are it. That is where Google's putting all their effort and energy. Uh, and this is what's powering voice search as well. These, these kind of card style answers are also on the rise a little bit. This is one of the more unusual ones, but best marketing conferences. I, I was frustrated. Like, how do you get in there? I think that's just web mentions with the words best marketing conferences, like the, the top 10 results and whether your entity is mentioned, but that, that's a tricky one. Another big change, speaking of voice, is we're going from this like just voice search, which is essentially just a, a substitute for typing to smart assistants. Only problem with Fitbit, you have to click a bunch of times to get the clock, all right. Uh, so voice search, I don't think is actually a threat. Like, voice search doesn't bother me at all. If you're just using the voice as a substitute for having to type, no problem. It doesn't worry me. Where the threat, because, because a voice search still pulls up results, right? The problem is smart assistant, where you start typing or you start, and, and they suggest things, right? So I say book a table, and they say, oh, you, we're gonna guess you want one of these few restaurants. Right? as opposed to showing you results and giving the opportunity for you know, some enterprising uh, new website to appear in those results. That's, that's tough. Uh, voice answers. Voice answers is a massive threat. Most of the time, o over the many years that I've been here and at other conferences, uh, what I've said is, so far, I have not seen the thing that could potentially destroy SEO forever. Like, I don't think SEO is dying. I still don't think that. But in my opinion, voice answers are the, the one thing that could be that threat. Voice answers could dismantle our industry. They could take away a tremendous amount of opportunity for SEOs and marketers to appear in results because there will be no results, right? A voice answer is just you know, Alexa or, or Google Home or Cortana or, or Siri answering back to you and saying, here's the answer, here's the thing you wanted, and now no, no more chance to, for people to see results and choose one of them. That's truly scary. I don't think it's coming yet, and I haven't seen the signs of like, oh my God, we're already there, the end is near. 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there yet, but I would keep my eye on this one. I think this is, this is the real threat. All right, and last, speaking of huge threats to the world, um, you may be aware that the United States had an election um, and that the people sort of lost that election. At least the popular vote of the people lost that election. Uh, and as a result, we have a, a number of challenges that we're facing, including a big, big threat to web marketing. Most of the time, uh, I do not directly bring up political stuff in this, but I think net neutrality is actually less of a politics issue and more of a, wait, how is that going to affect all of us who work on the web? Now, caveat here, in the EU, to my knowledge uh, so far and from my research, net neutrality does not appear to be under the same risk or threat that it is in the United States. But uh, we have a saying, shit rolls downhill. Um, and so I, I fear very much what could happen uh, in Europe and in the rest of the world uh, should this take place in the United States. So let's, first let's talk about uh, what, what net neutrality is. Um, you, you probably, if you weren't already aware, uh, the new American administration is, is very actively trying to kill this. But basically, net neutrality is this idea that when your internet service provider on your mobile device, on your desktop, uh, gives you access to the internet. They give you access to every site on the web and every application and every you know uh, portal or every port uh, with with equality, right? There's no there's no like oh well this is Google's website let's make it faster for everyone. Every every other website is slower, right? There's a neutral opportunity. You can access everything regardless of your provider at the same speed, same rate, uh, same cost. What ISPs would love to be able to do, would love to be able to do, because they can make so much money from it, is to be able to say, oh wait, you know what, let's charge more if you want to read blogs. Uh, we'll give you Facebook for free, we'll make games a lot of money, we'll make email free, and YouTube will be uh, a $5 a month surcharge. And then what happens? All of us go, oh shit. The only place I can be, the only place that I can easily access all of my customers is through social. So I guess Facebook is the internet now because 50% of the people who are in my audience don't even pay to have access to blogs from their ISP anymore. That is scary. This, this could be the world, right? You, you could look at an ISP and it could say, all right, Pay 30 bucks, get access. Oh, oh gosh, did you, did you want to be able to visit Amazon.com? Well, that's going to be a five buck extra because we, we charge an extra five bucks to access e-commerce. Oh, and would you like to access you know, the rest of the web? That's going to be you know, 10 bucks, 10 bucks, five bucks here. Spooky. Spooky, right? That removes a tremendous amount of opportunity, especially for folks starting new websites or those of us who aren't these power players and can build all these relationships. And if you think I'm joking or, or being overly concerned, like Ajit Pai is the new FCC chairman. He was just appointed by Trump a few weeks ago, and he is working actively to dismantle net neutrality right now. Like this is a future that is not, um, it's not like voice search where I'm scared about it happening in a few years. Like, but, you know, in the next two or three years, it could be reality in the United States that, that whoops, you know, that this is our world, right? And that, that we cannot, uh, act, we, we cannot access consumers over the web the same way we've been able to for a long time. If that happens, I think a few things will happen. Uh, ISPs are probably going to charge subscribers more to visit sites that are outside of some network, which is going to lower our traffic opportunities dramatically. What you'll probably see is Google actually show in your results, right? Google will look at who your ISP is, who you're paying, and they'll say, oh, this one you get for free, this one you get for free, this one, if you want to visit this site, you'd have to pay your ISP more or they're going to slow it down for you, right? And Google might only show results that are customized to your ISP, which means you've got to go, if you're a website owner, you've got to go make relationships with all the ISPs or pay money or something. Um, a lot of SEO is going to be on those sites that are included by ISP defaults. So it'll be a lot more barnacle SEO, like how do I get my opportunity on Facebook or on you know, Quora or whatever website is free for everyone to access. Uh, I think sites targeting rich consumers will probably be very unaffected. 
sites targeting consumers that are in the you know, sort of bottom 70, 60 percent uh, of earners more affected. And paying ISPs is probably going to be the way that many of us will have to go as, as we try and grow our traffic opportunity. If this is something you think, Rand, that sounds horrible. What the hell is going on in your damn country? Like, go back there and fix it. I wish I could, sorry. That's a little more challenging than, than you'd like. Uh, but you can, you can check out savetheinternet.org, um, and they actually have things that you can do, even as an EU citizen. Uh, same thing here, to fight against this and to preserve net neutrality, which I think is a really good thing for entrepreneurship uh, and web marketing as a whole. So with that, thank you so much. Really appreciate you having me. And I'll, uh, I'll catch up with you all this evening as well. Take care. Well, this is so much on time, right? It's 10 o'clock. Yeah, so thanks very much, Rand, and um, thanks for maybe uh, raising this topic in the end, because we are maybe sometimes uh, afraid of things coming like voice, but maybe this is the bigger threat. It looks like a little bit back in the 90s where we have this wallet garden concept like um, European online and, and stuff like this, in, uh, at least in Germany. Um, maybe we have one last question before we go into, um, into the break. And um, oh, I have Florian over here. And maybe I just, I'm just repeating your question then. Um, I'm wondering where the uh, Kixfilm data comes from. What panel is uh, the data source? Yeah. Uh, so um, Florian was raising the question, where does this Clickstream data come from? Yes. So uh, the company that produces the Clickstream data or that collects it is called JumpShot. Uh, they're JumpShot Inc. on Twitter. Their methodology is basically that they have software that is installed uh, on many desktop browsers. Uh, some of that's like antivirus software or uh, free or freemium software. Um, and then it monitors all the browser activity. Uh, in the, on mobile, it's uh, installed software, usually installed apps, right? So essentially, there's lots of free apps that will send data back to, or even ISPs will send data back to uh, jump shot. Their panel size is, I think it's somewhere between, they say somewhere between 2 and 10 million. Um, it's in the middle of that range, right? Would you say that this is a more No, I would say it's a not, not as technical a panel uh, as, an, it's more average users, right? So it's people who tend not to be able to do browser sniffing and see who's monitoring their traffic. Um, it tends to be, you know, it's like, um, it's my parents and my grandparents and, you know, my less techie family members. Uh, it is not on Linux, it's not on Unix, it's not on um, iOS. So this is Android on mobile and uh, mostly Windows uh, on, P on desktop PC. Super. So, then, thanks very much. Yeah, Again, oh my God, Rand, my super. pleasure. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks.